There are some dishes that belong to a collection I like to call the perfect foods. The dumpling, the taco, the sandwich, the falafel. However, one food endures in my heart, a food of a thousand faces, a food that can shapeshift from cheap dinner to fancy fare and still retain its iconic set of flavors. There's signature local variations and regional rivalries. It's definitely American, yet certainly Italian. I'm talking, of course, about pizza, a food so transcendent that even bad pizza is good. Of course, you, my nerdy friend, don't want to make bad pizza. You want to make excellent pizza. You want pizza precision. You just happen to want those beautiful layers of complex flavor without the meat. This would seem a simple enough request, but the supermarkets, vegetarian, and vegan topping options have so often been unsatisfying. But I've come to tell you that there's a better way to make pizza, one with simple, elegant, and vegetal deliciousness. Welcome to Root Kitchen, ladies and gentlemen. Today, we're making pizza. Now, a pizza stands or falls by way of its crust. These days, there are a few stores that carry decent pizza dough in their refrigerated section, ready to go. However, if you want to guarantee the best flavor and texture, which I'm sure you do, the best route is to make your own dough. Don't go clicking on another video. It's absolutely worth it to make your dough from start to finish, and it won't take nearly as much work as you think it will. Watch this. We start with one and a half cups of warm water, 20 ounces by weight of bread flour or Italian double zero imported flour, a teaspoon of instant yeast, and finally, two teaspoons of kosher salt. Turn your stand mixer with the dough hook attachment to low, and there you go. Once it all comes together roughly, set your timer for 10 minutes and let it knead until it looks like this. You want it to be a little sticky to the touch, but you want it to pull away from the sides of the bowl pretty easily. Now all you have to do is roll it up, coat it with olive oil, and cover with plastic wrap. Set it aside in the refrigerator for at least eight hours. Yes, I said eight hours. A cold rise will allow our yeast to ferment this dough longer, leading to a more flavorful crust with a better bubble structure. It will also aid in the crucial gluten development process. The more the gluten is developed in the dough, the less it will tear when we try to stretch it out. So give it time, fridge it up overnight. Okay, 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 if you absolutely must let it rise in a warm place for about an hour if you're in a pinch, but you really should give it a cold rise. And while our dough rises, let's talk toppings. Legend has it that in June of 1889, pizzaiola Rafael Esposito crafted a pizza with tomatoes, fresh mozzarella cheese, and basil, the three colors of the Italian national flag to honor Queen Margarita of Savoy, thus birthing the traditional pizza we know and love today. However, the legend is apocryphal, and people had been putting vegetables, cheese, meats, and oils on top of flatbreads in the area for centuries beforehand. So what was the definite moment that pizza, topped as we recognize it today, came into being? The facts are difficult to discern from the fiction, and truth be told, it's rather futile to look for the precise moment. But whenever pizza got its start, it really took hold in the United States, first with a few shops in New York, Boston, and Chicago in the early 1900s, and by the post-war 1950s, pizza had exploded in popularity all over the United States. Now you can still get the famed margarita pizza and others made in its style today in pizzerias which adhere to maniacally strict standards about mm, every last detail, including but not limited to the exclusive use of Italian zero or double zero flour, fresh brewer's yeast, or any Neapolitan yeast, sea salt kneading by hand or by a selection of approved machines, use of San Marzano tomatoes grown on volcanic soil south of Mount Vesuvius, fresh mozzarella de bufala harvested by semi-wild water buffalo and campana, baked in an oven at a minimum of 800 degrees, created by an oak wood fire for 60 to 90 seconds. And what do you get for all this radical compliance? The privilege of paying an inspection fee and yearly dues to the Association of True Neapolitan Pizza. Well, I am by no means going to pay those dues or follow the most minute rules, but we can glean great wisdom from our Neapolitan friends. The first of which being top sparingly. The great temptation of American pizza is to load it with so many toppings that the soggy crust simply wilts under all the weight. 
we must limit ourselves not only to the number of toppings we use, but the amount of each we dose onto the pizza. Bearing that in mind, it's not impossible to make thoughtful, delicious toppings that will add rather than subtract from our final pie. Something like pepperoni. Yes, pepperoni. Tender, salty, crispy, peppery circles gracing the surface of your pizza. What's the best way to achieve this quality of topping in the meatless world? Making them at home. I know it sounds like more hassle than it's worth, but I'm here to show you a simple method for tasty veggie pepperoni, and let's be honest, the store-bought variety will pale in comparison once you've had these. Mushrooms are the member of the vegetable world most often ascribed meat-likeness. Although not exactly like meat, different mushrooms have different characteristics that can, to a large degree, match the flavor, texture, and richness of animal-based substances. For pepperoni, we want something that will get us nice-sized round medallions. The best mushrooms for the job are king oysters. These massive tube-shaped mushrooms have stems with a long vertical grain, and that makes them perfect for a salami because once we slice it into rounds and apply some heat, it'll have a very tender and meaty texture. The best way to slice our mushrooms will be to use a mandolin slicer. Using a cut-resistant glove like this one ensures maximum flexibility and control and minimum flesh wounds. So we take each of our mushrooms and we're just gonna trim off the woody end part. And then we're gonna do eighth inch medallions all the way down. Got about a pound of mushrooms here. We're gonna set that aside in a flat container and prepare our marinade. This will deliver that unmistakable pepperoni flavor to our mushroom medallions. In your mixing bowl, whisk together three quarters of a cup of red wine, one tablespoon each of soy sauce and balsamic vinegar, a teaspoon of maple syrup and a half teaspoon of liquid smoke, a finely minced clove of fresh garlic, and one teaspoon of Spanish smoked paprika, hot or sweet depending on your heat preferences, and we're just going to whisk that together. Then we can pour it right over our mushrooms, making sure we get even coverage. You can let this rest for a couple of hours or even overnight in the refrigerator. However, if you prefer your pepperoni, say, right now, a 10 minute soak will do the job. Just keep in mind the flavor intensifies as the mushrooms marinate. Remember to preheat your oven to 350 degrees 30 minutes before you're ready to roast your mushrooms. After marinating, remove the mushrooms from the fridge and prepare two half sheet pans with parchment paper. We're just gonna drizzle a couple of tablespoons of olive oil onto each pan and brush that on in an even layer. Lay each mushroom slice down across the pan tightly so the edges are touching but no mushrooms overlap. And we want to make sure to get off the extra marinade so it doesn't sizzle up and burn. Once our mushrooms are down, sprinkle with kosher salt and generously grind black pepper over the surface. I mean, they are called pepperoni, after all. After our mushrooms are seasoned, let them sit in the middle of your 350 degree oven for 20 to 30 minutes depending on how well you like them done. If the destination is pizza, you'll want to lean less crispy at this stage so they don't turn to charcoal atop your pie. Make sure you flip them halfway through and season the other side with kosher salt and pepper. Once your mushrooms have roasted, retrieve them from the oven and allow them to cool for a few minutes before you handle them. Meanwhile, in your mixing bowl, prepare the rest of the spices. A half teaspoon of Spanish smoked paprika, a quarter teaspoon each of garlic and onion powder, an eighth teaspoon of cayenne pepper, or more if you like it hot and a half teaspoon of fennel seeds, as well as a section of star anise toasted and ground in a mortar and pestle. Once your mushrooms have cooled, place them in a bowl, toss them to coat with the spices, and taste to see if more salt and pepper are necessary. The texture is chewy and meaty, the aroma is intense, the flavor is positively addictive. These are pizza ready. And now for the sauce. We begin with a can of whole tomatoes packed in puree. Bonus if you get Italian plum tomatoes, double bonus if you get San Marzano tomatoes, which we're using here today. You want to have a fine mesh strainer ready over your bowl. Split the tomato open with your finger, which should be pretty easy. These guys are nice and tender and just scoop out the seeds into the strainer. We'll retain the juice from the inside without getting any of the bitter tomato seeds in our pizza. Once that's done, all that's left to do is to crush the tomatoes, I did this by hand, you can use a potato masher, and add some of the tomato puree from the can. A touch of kosher salt and fresh ground black pepper should do the trick. That's it. 
no cooking required, no stewing your sauce for hours and hours, no crazy herbs, no distracting aromatics, just simple, delicious tomato flavor. We've already got so many flavors in the mix here that we don't need our sauce to be complicated. Besides, it just leaves you more time to make the other stuff. For cheese, I like a good fresh mozzarella. And certainly you can find fresh mozzarella at the store, but the price is a bit hefty, but hey, that's Italian food, right? Miyoko's Creamery makes an excellent fresh vegan mozzarella, cashew and coconut based, that behaves a whole lot like dairy mozzarella in the flavor and texture department. However, avoid at all costs the dairy-free cheese shreds that turn into a Velveeta-like sludge on top of your pizza. Those need never ruin a good quality pizza. Given a choice between those and cheese-free, I'd go cheese-free every time. Our dough appears to be ready to go. If you're giving it a refrigerated rest, make sure you pull it out of the refrigerator a couple hours ahead of baking. Ice cold dough doesn't like to stretch, and plus it'll be a real struggle for your hands to handle the temperature for very long. I like to pull mine out on pizza morning, divide it into three or four pieces, depending on how big of a pizza I'm making, and cover it with plastic wrap and then a tea towel until it's time to cook. As for baking methods, they're endless. If you're just fine with an evenly golden brown American pizza, I wholeheartedly recommend the Humble Pizza Screen. It allows air to pass underneath, giving your pizza a crisp crust, and the pizza slides off easily onto the cutting board when it's finished. However, if we want to emulate that beautiful leopard spot char we find in a Neapolitan pizzeria, we're going to need a big dose of heat. You can get that in a couple ways, but my favorite is this sucker. A big old slab of high carbon steel able to keep blazing hot temperatures and give your pizza's bottom crust a delicious mottled char pattern. And unlike a pizza stone, it's virtually indestructible. And of course, it's more on the expensive side, but if you were looking to buy a pizza stone anyway, a few more dollars gets you a more effective instrument that pays for itself by not breaking. Ever. Well, if you're not ready to invest just yet, a gold cast iron skillet will do the trick. Preheat it in a blazing hot oven, pull it out, and construct your pizza right on top. Put it under the broiler until the top is done, and then crisp up the bottom on a stove top set to high heat. However you choose to heat your pizza, we begin with shaping the dough. Make sure your dough ball is generously floured. Start by docking it with your fingertips, just flattening and stretching it out, getting a little bit of excess dough on the outside to form the crust. We're just getting it flexible here. Whether you spin your dough in the air or leave it firmly on the board, our goal for this pie is 12 inches. We top the pizza with a bit of sauce. Go gentle with this or your pizza is going to turn out too soupy. Then we pull apart our fresh mozzarella, vegan or otherwise, and scatter it over the sauce. No need for full coverage, it'll melt and spread as we bake. Next we lay down our pepperoni mushrooms, then a bit of sun-dried tomato for richness and flavor contrast. And then this next one we'll just top as a margarita pizza with our sauce, the fresh mozzarella, and a few torn basil leaves on the top. For baking on a pizza screen, all we have to do is pop it into a preheated 550 degree oven in the upper middle rack and wait about 10 minutes until it's golden brown and delicious. A pizza steel or a cast iron skillet will require a 30 minute preheat in the same 550 degree oven. This should only take about five to seven minutes before we have a nice, beautiful charred pie. So there you have it, pizza in all of its simplicity and complexity, from the hearty crust to the bright tomatoes, the gooey cheese, and the flavorful toppings. The world is your pizza, veggie nerds.